Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we would like to welcome you now to this press briefing, which is organized by Executive Intelligence Review. My name is Webster Tarpley. I'm a contributing editor of Executive Intelligence Review. We're very pleased, above all, this afternoon to be able to present you with our special feature study entitled The Coming Fall of the House of Windsor. We feel that this is a kind of analysis that no other publication in the world would be capable of offering at this time. And we will hear in a moment from a number of the authors of this study. Now you will notice that our account of the policies of the House of Windsor is in the form of an indictment for high crimes against humanity according to the Nuremberg Code. And the main charge is that uh, Prince Philip Mountbatten, alias the Duke of Edinburgh, working together with the World Wildlife Fund, has over the past 33 years, approximately, engaged in a campaign of deliberate genocide against the nations and populations of Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa. This campaign of genocide has been carried out under the banner of radical ecologism, that is to say the lunatic contention that the main problems facing humanity are overpopulation and industrial pollution. And as we will hear documented with quotes, these are principal ideological obsessions of Prince Philip himself. One of Philip's leading accessories in these crimes has been Prince Bernard of the Netherlands of the House of Orange Nassau. Now, Prince Philip has mobilized for the purpose of carrying out this genocide, a continuing criminal enterprise, which includes such organizations as the Club of the Isles, the 1001 Club, and others with the leadership made up of the British-centered European oligarchy. It also includes the World Wildlife Fund, as we will point out. Implicated also in these genocidal activities are companies and corporations in the orbit of the British Crown and the City of London, including such as Imperial Chemical Industries, Royal Dutch Shell, Rio Tinto Zinc, De Beers Consolidated Mines, the Anglo-American Corporation, Lonro, Unilever, the City of London banking establishment in general. There are also parts of the British government involved, including factions of British intelligence and such organizations as Special Air Services. We also point to the role of Baroness Linda Chalker and the so-called Overseas Development Ministry of Great Britain. They're also implicated. Now, this network uh, has most notably created a series of protected nature parks or wilderness areas uh, across sub-Saharan Africa. We'll be showing you uh, some of these in just a moment. These were built on the model of Lord Kitchener's and Lord Milner's Kruger National Park in South Africa. It is perhaps ironic, as we point out, that the World Wildlife Fund and its retainers have actually ended up slaughtering, for the purposes of profit and greed, the very animal species that they have taken money to protect. But this is, of course, only incidental to F Prince Philip's plan, which is to treat people like these animals. Prince Philip's network has used the African nature parks as bases for guerrilla warfare, destabilization, revolution, terrorism, secret armies, paramilitary activities, and subversion. Our report catalogs numerous overt acts of this type. Most recently, most notably, the use of the nature parks along the border between Uganda and Rwanda by the British puppet Museveni, the president of Uganda, who has set into motion the invasion of Rwanda by sections of the Ugandan army calling themselves the Rwandan Patriotic Front. This operation involved Baroness Chalker and Museveni and has resulted in the deaths of almost one million persons in the past two years. But this is only a hint of what Prince Philip's policies would do to the world if they were to be fully realized and applied everywhere. In his introductory section to our report, 
Lyndon LaRouche points out that the net impact of Phillips' policy of depopulation and deindustrialization would be to lower the relative potential population density of our planet far below the level of the current population. That means that if Philip prevails, world population could be expected to fall from the present level, just short of six billion people, to perhaps less than one billion, and that within the very short space of two generations. As LaRouche also notes, this kind of demographic implosion would administer a colossal shock to the collective immune system of all higher forms of life on this planet. And that might indeed result in the total extinction of human life by the close of the 21st century. And that would be the real end of history. This also might come about through the collapse of the biosphere, which is, of course, primarily sustained by human activity. So as we point out at numerous locations in the report, the indictment alleges crimes that are far worse than those of Hitler and the Nazis. Now we have chosen Africa as our main case study to provide exhibits of Phillips methods. But we also show that similar methods are being applied on other continents, notably Ibero-America and here in North America. And we point out Phillips sponsorship, for example, of indigenous peoples for the purpose of stopping economic development over vast areas. We show that there is a plan to balkanize North America into petty states. That includes the planned breakup of Canada, which in turn would inject the bacillus of secessionism into the United States. So treason thus appears along with genocide in the Bill of Indictment. Now, although we uh, accuse Prince Philip of a great deal, we do not accuse him of originality. The elements of Philip's policies are not new, but they have been around for many thousands of years. These are the typical characteristic features of oligarchy, of oligarchism, as these have been observed in every oligarchical society, down from Babylon, Mesopotamia, the Greek cult of the Delphic Apollo, Venice, and down to our own time. Indeed, Philip and his networks represent the current form of an oligarchical faction, which we can trace back in unbroken continuity to Babylon, Tyre, and earlier oligarchical regimes. So in this sense, Philip and company are simply displaying their nature as oligarchs. They may indeed be incapable of doing anything else. The oligarchical faction in history can be identified through its characteristic form of being a self-styled master race, an elite of aristocratic families who are obsessed with the idea that they are the lords of all creation. These families think that they have been placed above God's law and above natural law. The families think that they are placed uh, in this position thanks to an epistemology which is based on a stoic reading of Aristotle. The oligarchs insist that the human mind knows only the objects of sense and of sense certainty, and never thought objects or creative discovery as such. The oligarchs see man as an animal, deprived of any spark of creative reason. Oligarchical society operates through a wholly irrational principle of domination, with a tiny aristocratic elite commanding over a vast and degraded mass of slaves, serfs, helots, or subjects today, depending on what the traffic would bear. As a would-be master race, the oligarchs are inherently racist towards those who are not of Anglo-Saxon or Anglican background in this case. Because of the need to keep these degraded helots in their place, the oligarchy is hostile to the notion of an educated citizenry and cultivates hatred of science technology, and progress, since these are seen as interfering with the need for domination. The oligarchical elite is monetarist from the word go. They seek wealth exclusively in the form of money amassed by the elite, today usually in the form of paper. The oligarchical elite is addicted to usury and related exorbitant interest rates on paper instruments like today's derivative securities. The bestialism of the oligarchy is expressed in international affairs in geopolitics, 
the methods of divide and conquer, and the balance of power. And British meddling in these departments has brought us the two world wars of this century. The oligarchs necessarily converge on empire as a political system, with the British empire of only yesterday being the prime example. In the service of all these policies, the oligarchs fabricate myths saying that the earth is overpopulated or over-industrialized. And of course, they hire scribblers and demagogues to propagate those views. The oligarchy does not have a monopoly on evil in the world, but the oligarchy has been the focus of evil, shall we say, in the macro realm when it comes to wars, including world wars, famines, depressions, genocide, and the like. The oligarchy has generally been at work. Now, whenever control of a form of civilization falls into the hands of such an oligarchy, that civilization promptly turns onto the path leading to its own collapse. This is the kind of catastrophic collapse or breakdown crisis of civilization that is implied by Prince Philip's policies imposed on today's world. Now, today, the British monarchy, the House of Mountbatten-Windsor, is falling apart. This is related to the nature of current history. We are currently living through the culmination of a 500-year cycle of European and world history. Now, the basis for our present-day world civilization, including population, standards of living, and so forth, is to be found in the Italian Renaissance of the 15th century. The positive aspects of today's world have been possible thanks to the work of such figures as Nicholas Cusanos, Leonardo da Vinci, Raffaello Sanzio, and the other founders of modern science back in the Quattrocento. These figures, plus such later followers in the same tradition as Leibniz and Kepler uh, and their heirs, are the essence of modern science. This tradition is so fecund that it has produced more and better scientific progress during the past 500 years than in all previous human history. Our world is based on this Renaissance science, plus Dante's concept of the sovereign independent nation state as it was first realized in 15th century France by Louis XI. The United States is a later example of the same tradition. Now these are the great achievements of modern civilization, but they have always been opposed by the oligarchy. In the period of the Renaissance, the main center of European oligarchism was Venice. Venice, the heiress of earlier oligarchical traditions coming from Delphi, Sparta, the Roman Empire, and the Byzantine Empire. So between about 1100 and 1600, Venice was the world capital of evil in this sense. The threat to Venice from Renaissance science and the Renaissance nation state was pointed up most dramatically in the 1509 War of the League of Cambrai. In that War of the League of Cambrai, the new nation states like France and Spain, plus the papacy and virtually every other country in Europe, combined in an alliance seeking to wipe out Venice. The Venetians were able to break up the League of Cambrai by corrupting the Pope. But the Venetian countermeasures in the wake of the War of the League of Cambrai have had the most profound impact on today's world. Those measures included the division of Europe by the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation, leading to the wars of religion and the Thirty Years' War. But the Venetians also concluded that in the era of large or even continental nation states, they could no longer hope to conduct their geopolitical manipulations from the base of a tiny city-state in the marshes and lagoons of the northern Adriatic. So during these years, the Venetian oligarchy decided to transfer itself and its baggage, including its fondi, or family fortunes, its characteristic outlook and methods, to the north, to England. In short, the British Empire is the continuation of Venice. And the British, as distinct from the English or the Scots or the Irish, are transplanted Venetians. Gasparo Contarini, a Venetian of the early 1500s, sent his fellow Venetian oligarch Francesco Zorzi to the court of Henry VIII to advise King Henry on his divorce from Catherine of Aragon. And Zorzi stayed on at the English court as Henry VIII's resident sex counselor. 
One of the results of that activity of Zorzi as a sex counselor has been the Church of England, a very important British institution which is also in a deep crisis today. Now, Zorzi was already the big influence on Sir Philip Sidney and Edmund Spencer. And we find that British culture overall, since that time, has been assembled mainly through British plagiarism from Venetian originals. Examples. In the early 1600s, the boss of Venetian intelligence was Paolo Sarpi, who provided the idea content for Sir Francis Bacon, for John Milton, John Locke, David Hume, and the British empiricists. In the 1700s, the Venetian group around Antonio Conti and Gian Maria Ortes provided the idea content for the generation of Lord Shelburne, including Adam Smith, Jeremy Bentham, Thomas Malthus, Charles Darwin, for the utilitarians and the British philosophical radicals in general. So over the years, the Tzorzi and Sarpi networks infested England with Venetian agents like Thomas Cromwell and the Cecil family. And with the coming of the Stuart dynasty, by about 1600, a full-fledged Venetian party had emerged in England. And by 1688, the so-called Glorious Revolution, this Venetian party had afflicted England with a full-blown oligarchical system, complete with a king who was not an absolute monarch on the French model, but rather a kind of Venetian doge. Between 1688 and 1815, Venetian intelligence played the indispensable role of helping the new British Empire to eliminate France as a global competitor and come close to world domination. During the 19th century, especially under Lord Palmerston, the British came close again to total world domination, but their attempt at universal monarchy was blocked by the alliance of Abraham Lincoln and Tsar Alexander II of Russia. During the 20th century, the British oligarchy has survived largely through a parasitizing of the economic and military resources of the United States through the so-called special relationship, which was begun almost 100 years ago under Theodore Roosevelt. Now, President Clinton has, says that he, has said that he intends to terminate this special relationship in favor of cooperation of the United States with Germany and with Russia. And this explains the great hostility shown to the president by the British oligarchy, one of the expressions of which has been the White Watergate affair. Now today, the British and related oligarchs have come very close to wiping out the Christian humanism and science of the Renaissance. And this is the principal cause for the unfolding world breakdown crisis of civilization on this planet. The world market for derivative securities is centered in London, and it now amounts to upwards of $40 trillion, almost all of which has been created since the 1987 crash. Now, this derivative security market is now experiencing the seismic shocks, which are the precursors of a final panic crash. When the derivatives crash, they will bring about the disintegration of most of the current international financial system including the IMF, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the dollar, the other world currencies, and most of the banking system. This will be a crash without precedent during the entire 500-year cycle that we're considering. To find a comparison, you must go back to the 1300s, to the fall of the Venetian-led Lombard banks, the Bardi, the Peruzzi, uh, and others. This was initiated, uh, this initiated the great crisis of the 14th century, which brought with it the, ba the Black Death and the Hundred Years' War, the events described in Barbara Tuckman's book, A Distant Mirror. Now, that was the crisis out of which the Renaissance emerged. Today, the 500-year cycle is ending again in a breakdown crisis, and we are threatened with a return of that distant horror, and we are threatened with its return right here in the United States. Now, I would stress that the programmatic forces associated with executive intelligence review, especially our founder, Lyndon LaRouche, 
know what to do in order to create an economic recovery and indeed a new renaissance without having to go through another dark age. As LaRouche has put it, we know how to build a bridge from hell to purgatory. But the precondition for that is that the policies of Prince Philip and his clique, including their expression in the United Nations <coughs> supranational world government, must go. Now that brings us to my, my final point, the dynastic crisis of the House of Hanover or of Windsor or Hanover Battenberg or Mountbatten Windsor, as it may be called. Now historically, these people have been judged and found wanting. And the handwriting is not just in the London tabloids, it's on the wall for all to see. Georg Ludwig of the Welfen or Guelph House of Hanover started off as George I of England under the auspices of that Venetian patrician Antonio Conti at the time of Conti's Newton operation. This original stock was not promising. A bit later came George III, and as our founding fathers here in the United States knew, George III was mad as a hatter. Prince Albert of saxe coburg gotha produced a brood of princelings with Queen Victoria, but there was still no improvement. Edward VIII was too much a friend of Hitler to stay on the throne, so the oligarchy decided that he had to abdicate, and soon he was gone with the Windsors. The Battenbergs, or Mountbattens, arriving on the scene during this century have not helped either. Lord Louis Mountbatten and his wife Edwina, that menage that was known as the Dickie and Edwina show, distinguished itself only through antics that would have made Casanova blush. And Uncle Dickie, I'm afraid, has been the greatest single influence on Prince Charles. Now the issue is, if a prince who says that he talks to plants, not only that he talks to plants, but that they answer him, is qualified to be sovereign of the United Kingdom and head of the Church of England. According to the signals we've observed coming from over there, the British establishment, the oligarchy itself, seems to be saying that the current line of royals cannot be allowed to go on. So the result is likely to be a change of dynasty or an extinction of the monarchy itself. After the First World War and even more after the Second World War, when so many royal houses had been uh, expropriated, it used to be said that there were five unshakable pillars of monarchy. There were five kings that counted hearts, diamonds, clubs, uh, and spades, and England. Today, it looks like the English monarchy may also be gone with the Windsors. Now, as Friedrich Schiller once observed, world history is the world court. What we would now like to present to you is a more detailed exposition of the specific points in this indictment, which we are submitting to the court of world public opinion. Let me now give the floor to Jeff Steinberg. <coughs> The copy of the EIR that I presume all of you now have in your hands uh, was the immediate result of work that has taken place over a period of the last seven months involving uh, dozens of researchers, EIR researchers, a number of people who've collaborated with us on this effort, working on uh, every continent uh, on Earth. And in the course of this effort, we found that in order to actually come to an understanding of the actual nature of the strategic crisis of the day, and particularly the uh, role of Prince Philip and the World Wildlife Fund and other allied agencies in this effort, it was first necessary to come to grips with and eventually debunk four rather significant myths which have served to blind the vast majority of human beings from understanding the true nature of the political crisis that we've been increasing, increasingly falling in throughout the course of the 20th century. The first of the myths that hopefully this special report and a series of follow-on articles that will be published in 
the next several issues of the EIR makes clear as a myth is the notion that the British monarchy is somehow or other a powerless and irrelevant force in world affairs. The idea that the Queen herself is little more than an empty vessel sitting underneath a seemingly endless sequence of funny looking hats or that uh, Prince Philip is somehow or other just simply uh, her royal consort and a uh, man more known for his philandering than his politics. The idea that the entire House of Windsor and the extended European monarchy are essentially all pomp and no circumstance. The second derivative myth is the idea that uh, the political lack of power of the British House of Windsor is complemented by the fact that they have absolutely no financial or economic power. And uh, this in part derives from the fact that the wealth of the House of Windsor is largely secretive uh, and very little is known about even the normal corporate holdings, a fact that's facilitated by the fact that the Windsors don't pay taxes. The third myth, which one is forced to confront with in even just beginning to look at Prince Philip in his own words, in coming to understand what the philosophical and policy content is of the House of Windsor, is the idea that somehow this concept of the genocide of World War II can never happen again this idea of the myth of never again. In fact, the organizational structure that Prince Philip personally is in charge of represents nothing less than a full reconstituting on an even more vast scale of the Algemeine SS that was one of the arms of the Hitler genocide uh, during World War II. Um, there were three SS organizations, just to give people a brief uh, explanation of this particular point. There was the military organization called the Waffen-SS, which is probably most familiar to people. There was the Reiter-SS, which was the sort of knights of the Nazi regime, principally made up of uh, princes and royalty of uh, the Germanic area uh, who were also enthusiastic supporters, among the enthusiastic supporters of Hitler. But there was a far more important entity called the Allgemeine SS, which included those princes, but also included leading figures from within the industrial and financial community. And we're going to find that some of these people who were active figures in this Allgemeine SS organization during World War II were instrumental in reconstituting that same apparatus following the war under the banner of ecologism and under a number of different corporate entities. The fourth myth is the idea that somehow or other all power in the world rests in some named and identifiable front organization. And you very often find among populists here in the United States uh, a debate over whether or not the true center of world power is in the Bilderberg Society or the Trilateral Commission or the Council on Foreign Relations or the United Nations Organization. Uh, when one begins to grasp the concept of oligarchism, as Webster Tarpley presented it in brief just before me, uh, it should become almost self-evident that no entity that has a name and a board of directors and a formal list of assets and members uh, would conceivably be entrusted with the actual concentration of power that we're, ha that we're talking about here. ...of offering at this time. And we will hear in a moment from a number of the authors of this study. Now you will notice that our account of the policies of the House of Windsor is in the form of an indictment for high crimes against humanity according to the Nuremberg Code. And the main charge is that uh, Prince Philip Mountbatten, alias the Duke of Edinburgh, working together with the World Wildlife Fund, has over the past 33 years, approximately, 
engaged in a campaign of deliberate genocide against including such as Imperial Chemical Industries, Royal Dutch Shell, Rio Tinto Zinc, De Beers Consolidated Mines, the Anglo-American Corporation, Lonro, Unilever, the City of London banking establishment in general. There are also parts of the British government involved, including factions of British intelligence and such organizations as Special Air Services. We also point to the role of Baroness Linda Chalker and the so-called Overseas Development Ministry of Great Britain. They're of the Netherlands, of the House of Orange Nassau. Now, Prince Philip has mobilized for the purpose of carrying out this genocide, a continuing criminal enterprise, which includes such organizations as the Club of the Isles, the 1001 Club, and others with the leadership made up of the British-centered European oligarchy. It also includes the World Wildlife Fund, as we will point out. Implicated also in these genocidal activities are companies and corporations in the orbit of the British Crown and the City of London, in nations and populations of Africa, especially sub-Saharan Africa. This campaign of genocide has been carried out under the banner of radical ecologism, that is to say the lunatic contention that the main problems facing humanity are overpopulation and industrial pollution. And as we will hear documented with quotes, these are principal ideological obsessions of Prince Philip himself. One of Philip's leading accessories in these crimes has been Prince Bernard Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we would like to welcome you now to this press briefing, which is organized by Executive Intelligence Review. My name is Webster Tarpley. I'm a contributing editor of Executive Intelligence Review. We're very pleased, above all, this afternoon to be able to present you with our special feature study entitled The Coming Fall of the House of Windsor. We feel that this is a kind of analysis that no other publication in the world would be capable